these first couple of scriptures that say that the disciples are saying we need to find someone to replace Judas. One of these must come become a witness with us of his resurrection. This was just the wisdom they were using at that time. Are apostles for today? First up, we're going to watch a short clip from a lady called Catherine Crick, who claims to be an apostle today, who claims that apostles are for today, and in fact, she is a female apostle. Lord. And so a lot of people have the doctrine that apostles do, are not around today because an apostle must have seen Jesus in person. Ba -ba -da -ba, ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Ephesians 4 11 these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church apostles and these gifts were given after Jesus ascended okay after he ascended he then gave gifts so this is after the time of him commissioning the 12 disciples this is he is crucified resurrected poured his Holy Spirit to the church and he gave gifts to the church apostles are one of them one of the five it then says verse 13 this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Christ. So in other words, this equipping of the fivefold ministries, including the apostles, will continue until the bride has been perfectly prepared and Jesus has returned. Inconceivable. Inconceivable! 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 You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. We also see Romans 16, 7. This is the Passion Translation. Paul is saying, make sure, make sure that my relatives Ardronicus and Junia, that's a woman, are honored for they're my fellow captives who bear the distinctive mark of being outstanding and well-known apostles. So Adronicus and Junia, which is a woman, are well-known apostles. There we have another example of a woman in leadership. These people, Adronicus and Junia, they were after the time of Jesus being there on the earth. So we see there's apostles after who had not witnessed Jesus in person. First Thessalonians 2, 6, we, which is Paul, Timothy, and Silas, it says in the Bible, in one of the translations, it says, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, we were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So Timothy and Silas were also not the original 12, ones that had seen Jesus in person, the next generation. So there was a next generation of apostles being raised up under Paul's ministry. what's God's heart? Well, it doesn't really make sense why God would want to get rid of apostles when he says that this is in the, the foundation of the church with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. And this important equipping is necessary. All five of these ministries are necessary for the body of Christ to be fully equipped. Okay, that's God's Heart. And now we're going to look at context. These first couple of scriptures that say that the disciples are saying we need to find someone to replace Judas. One of these must come become a witness with us of his resurrection. This was just the wisdom they were using at that time. Might as well choose someone who actually witnessed Jesus. They'll probably be stronger in faith than those who didn't actually witness Jesus. This is brand new gospel here. It's more likely that people who were really with the apostles in the beginning saw Jesus, that they'll be stronger stronger in faith. Just at that time, it was just in that season. That makes sense. And apostles must be called by Jesus. And they see Jesus in the spiritual realm and God calls them. Sometimes that can come through a prophet prophesying, but they've seen Jesus through that encounter. Here are my rebuttals to each of her arguments. Argument one, Ephesians 4.11, she claims the gifts, as in the gifts of apostleship, pastor, teacher, evangelists, were given after Jesus ascended. If that is true, this refers to the ongoing ministry and giving of apostles. This is her claim. We might phrase this as a syllogism. Premise one, Christ gave the ministry of apostles after he ascended into heaven. Premise two, his twelve were chosen before his ascension. Conclusion, there must be apostles who were chosen after his ascension that are not in the twelve. Let's for a moment say this is true. 
Note what the passage does not say. It says nothing about the ongoing ministry of apostles through the ages. It simply says God gave them. It could be that the apostles were for the initial period, even after the ascension. So no matter how she wants to make it out, it does not support her claim. Let's read the actual passage. We'll start from verse 7 and read all the way to verse 13. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, and to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. It says nothing of the sorts to indicate he gave these gifts specifically after his ascension. The emphasis is not simply not on the word after. The word doesn't appear in the text. The text grounds the giving of these gifts in his ascension to underpin his authority. If Christ didn't have the authority to give or make apostles, then surely the twelve apostles, as in before his ascension, then surely the other twelve apostles wouldn't be true apostles, which would be a ridiculous claim. The text simply emphasizes the fact that Christ was raised, that to him belong all authority. It did already, but his ascension made it very obvious for the church. In other words, they have good reason to believe and trust in the fact that he indeed has all that authority and therefore can give these gifts to the church. In some sense, Christ calls his 12 apostles during his earthly ministry and then they were uniquely empowered when they received the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost, which is clearly seen in the change after this day by Peter preaching a sermon and 3,000 people being added to the church. Her claim that this means apostles are for today is a bogus claim because it's simply not found in the text. The text doesn't say otherwise either. In other words, the text does not say that apostles are not to continue. That is simply something that we have to establish from other biblical data. But it's important that her claim is also not in this text. Next, she claimed that verse 13 says, this will continue. Now, is that the emphasis of, as in this meaning, the gift of apostles? In the King James Version, it says, till we all come. And in the ESV, it says, until we attain. In the NIV, it says, until we reach. And in the NLT, it says, this will continue. So it's only in one of the, the English translations. But it's important then to look at what does this refer to. The immediate antecedent is not, as she claims, the gifts, as in apostles, prophets. The immediate antecedent of this is verse 12, and it is their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. In other words, the equipping and building up of the body of Christ will continue. That's what this means. Again, her claim is simply not supportable by the text. It is perfectly reasonable to view this as the building of the body of Christ and therefore does not necessitate an ongoing apostleship throughout the ages. This passage alone is insufficient to determine this either way. That question must be resolved from other passages of Scripture. And seeing that we're in the book, the epistle to the Ephesians, let's have a look two chapters back. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 20 to 22, because there we see a very strong picture 
that refutes her claim. Let's read verses 20 to 22. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Christ was the cornerstone of the building. The apostles and prophets were the foundation. The rest of the building is based on this sure foundation. Now many claim that we are building new buildings in each century and therefore need new foundations all the time, but I don't think that is the plain natural reading of the passage. Christ was the cornerstone. No one in their right mind would consider that the building needs multiple Christs. There are foundational roles in the church. Importantly, the tenses of the verbs in Ephesians 2 are important. The foundation to 20, as in chapter 2 verse 20, was having been built. This is what the Greek word tense is. It is a verb in the aorist passive past tense. In contrast, in chapter 2 verse 22, the building on top of the foundation is being built. And in Greek it is in the present tense tense. If the claim was true that each century needed new apostles, then this is not what this text says. And of course, we must therefore raise other important questions. Why are there no instructions in the New Testament for apostolic succession? Contrary to claims by the Roman Catholics, and in this case Charismatics, there is nothing in scripture to this suggest apostolic succession. Why are there definite instructions by the apostolic epistles, as in such as Timothy and Titus, for both the roles of deacon and elder, an elder being pastor, teacher, which is the same word in Greek, but there is silence on the offices of apostle and prophet. Given that these are more senior roles, the silence in the New Testament on this is deafening. Now, Crick claims that there is a fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4.11, but actually in the Greek, the word apostle and prophet is one word, and the word pastor teacher is also one word. And in that sense, Ephesians 4.11 is more like a threefold ministry, and Considering the emphasis on instruction for elder, pastor, teacher, later, there is really no fivefold ministry in the church at all. Argument number two. This is where she quotes Romans 16, verse 7. And I'm going to read the two important bits in four different versions. In the ESV, it says, Greet Andronicus and Junior. They are well known to the apostles. In the King James Version, it says, Salute Andronicus and Junior, who are of note among the Apostles. In the NIV, it says, Greet Andronicus and Junior, they are outstanding amongst the Apostles. And in the NLT, it tells us, in Greet Andronicus and Junior, they are highly respected amongst the Apostles. Scholars are actually divided over the name Junior, in, in, in Latin Junius, it is not clear whether this was a man or a woman. And so in here, I'm just simply giving her the benefit of the doubt that Junior was in fact a woman. That is by no means a, a stated fact. The overwhelming translation evidence points clearly towards the fact that she was simply an outstanding person and not a real apostle. In other words, she was just outstanding amongst the group of people who were called apostles. They highlighted many different people during their ministry. We must not forget that the word used for apostle in the New Testament can sometimes mean messenger. So it's possible that it is also meant here that simply she was outstanding amongst the messengers of the New Testament. Sometimes the word apostle is used in the context of the foundational role and sometimes of the context of messenger. This is New Testament scholarship Greek fact. 
It's a huge stretch to make this obscure passage into evidence in favor of the female role of apostle. And in all honesty, this is a very, very fringe view in, in even the, the, the Pentecostal world, the traditional classic Pentecostal world does not support this view. I won't even enter the argument of stretching this to overrule Acts 1, stating clearly that an apostle has someone who has witnessed the life of Christ in person. A cardinal rule of interpretation is to interpret the obscure by the clear and not the clear by the obscure. Argument number 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Let's read it. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Verse simply, 6 simply says, we. It does not, as she claim, say, Paul, Timothy, and Silas. Not a single translation inserts Paul, Timothy, and Silas. The only ground that she might have for this would have to go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul writes the letter on behalf of those three men. So let's assume that she's right and we refers to all three. It is far more congruent in the context to see these three as messengers that Paul is not referring to them as in the foundational role of apostle. And why do I say so? Elsewhere, Paul refers to Timothy as a messenger. Paul nowhere else refers to Timothy or Silas in the office of an apostle. The Jerusalem council was where Paul and Silas were sent as messengers of the council to bring the council decision. Read Acts chapter 17, the whole chapter. Her claim that this is evidence of Timothy and Silas being apostles is really stretched and has to be imposed on the passage. Her claim that this is text is evidence of a next generation of apostles being raised up is simply a ridiculous claim. I would suggest that she is desperately clutching at straws to give some support for her own bogus claim of being an apostle. Argument number four. She says it's God's heart. She says it makes perfect sense. Well, I would suggest otherwise. There is one cornerstone of the church, namely Christ. There is one sure foundation, namely that of the apostles. All three or five, depending on which way you look at Ephesians 4.11, are indeed necessary. But with scripture, we have the sure foundation of the apostles of Christ who gave us the revelation of scripture. These new apostles are either giving us new revelation, which means the canon of scripture is not closed and there is ongoing revelation, or they're not giving us new revelation, which means the office has nothing more to offer than what we already have with elders and teachers who are gifted to exposit scripture and teach sound doctrine, as is their role dictated by scripture itself. The idea of ongoing apostles is a self-refuting idea unless you posit that there is ongoing new revelation and the canon of scripture is not closed. Apart from this, to say it's God's heart is an arbitrary argument from subjective emotion which has no ground to stand on doctrinally. Argument number five. Here she makes the wild claim that Acts 1 is not to be taken seriously. She says, her words, this was just the wisdom they were using at that time. The claim note, read Acts 1 carefully yourself and see if this is what the text really supports. The text says nothing of the sort. She said it might, they might as well choose someone who actually witnessed Christ. Again, this is her claim. The text does not say that. The text explicitly says that that is a requirement. They will probably be stronger in faith. That's possibly true, but it is not the claim that the text itself makes. Again, it's a bogus claim. Is she really going to claim that all throughout the ages, believers were not strong in their faith because they didn't witness Christ in person? 
just because we have the word, we can't be strong in faith? That seems ridiculous to me. It was just in that time, just for that season. That's another bogus claim that's not supported by the text. Acts 1 is actually really plain and easy to understand. As I said, I suggest you read the account of replacing Judas slowly and quietly to see what it says yourself. Catherine Crick bends the text to say what it does not say in order to suit her agenda. Let's further look at some more evidence from the book of Acts. Acts 12 verses 1 and 2. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, unlike the events in Acts 1, where a new apostle to replace Judas was chosen, when James was put to death by Herod, there is no attempt to replace him. This is further evidence that the early apostles had a unique role to birth the church and were its foundation. This evidently is also strong evidence against the apostolic succession claims by Roman Catholicism. Let this maxim rule your interpretation. Interpret the obscure by the clear. Acts 1 is the clearest statement we have about the true role and responsibility of an apostle and the fact that they let the lot decide proves they feared God and were not game to choose an apostle themselves. Anyone who self-appoints himself or herself for this role, I believe, humbly said, is entirely arrogant, foolish at best, and downright wolfish at worst. I think you should carefully look at where Crick got this idea from in order to make up your mind about her. My recommendation, she is to be rejected as she treats scripture as something to be used to back her own claims, that she has made up before she comes to the text of Scripture, rather than humbly letting Scripture dictate what she believes. My hope is that you will let dicta Scripture dictate what you believe. I want to kill you now with my shoes. I want to kill him now. I'm about to kill him. Yes, yo, yo, yo. What are the signs of a false apostle? Here we're reviewing some video clips of self-proclaimed modern female apostle Catherine Crick and who her mentor is to see where she has come from, who's the background personality behind her idea of being an apostle, and what is it all about? So powerful, and he, he has such a pure, amazing heart, and the words that he speaks are true. They are straight from God. He is the mouthpiece of God, and um, yeah, if, if he speaks into your life like he did to mine, you are very blessed, and I just am... Um, just overcome with gratitude. Ever since that day, I began being mentored by Pastor David. So for you to have the prophet of prophets as your leader, I consider you the most favored people in the world. First Corinthians 1, 11 to 13 and 22 to 23. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Jews demand signs and Greek seeks wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. She calls him the prophet of prophets, and his audience the most favoured people in the world. One of the most disturbing elements of the charismatic movement is the worship of people with so-called special anointing 
and the lack of Christ-centered preaching in this entire video, Christ isn't really mentioned. Cult leaders receive adulation like this. In fact, only really cult leaders do. Remember what we just read by Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church. Shwari <laughs> Are demons being cast out here or is this some form of demon worship? Jesus never made a fanfare of casting out demons. He never attempted two or three or four times. He never made a show of it like this. In each incident in scripture there is instant peace as the demon is gone and the fruit of a changed person. Never is a person slain by hypnosis like this man does. We have no evidence of this depiction in this depiction whether anything has really changed. What we do see is multitudes worship and adulate the man. This is a vile display of human power and manipulation. It is not a godly true miracle. This makes a mockery of true biblical miracles. This next bit, supposed deliverance, is a disgusting display of human power exerted over another human being. Come here yourself. No one has to hold you. This is supreme authority. Okay, stand properly. Face me. Salute me. Salute me. You have to salute me. I mean, you have to salute me. Do that. Look at my shoes. You see these shoes? I've killed many demons. Do you know? Are you aware of it? You are aware. Okay. What style would you like to go? Please compare this the way with the way Jesus acted and compare Jesus' actions to this man. This man calls himself the supreme authority. That is blasphemous. 
He also calls himself a general and forces the lady to humiliate by humiliating her to force and forces her to salute him. He may pretend that the demon should do this. Nonetheless, this is him pretending that he has some special power when only God has both the power and authority and the humble person would never behave in this way. Compare this with the way the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, demonstrate miracles. There is something deeply disturbing and possibly demonic in activity behind this man. He is not a godly man at all. This is a disgusting display of human power wielded in a cult-like manner to, to force submission. The jeering and clapping only demonstrates the immaturity of the crowd. The long-term psychological damage being done in the name of God is awful. The deception runs deep. Look at my shoes, he says. They've killed many demons. This is both ridiculous on the one hand and also incredibly arrogant and vile on the other. Those who spiritually oppress God's people will not go unpunished. Mark 9.42 Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Read also Mark 10, 42 to 45. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I am told by my parents that I began to... Uh, prophesy when I was at the age of five, the age of five. Next, he tells us he was a prophet at the age of five. The example he gives is both simplistic and childish and borders on the ridiculous. That's when I began to prophesy. And wow. um, it was like, um, um, I would say something and that something would come to Past. There were many events that I said and happened, but, but let me mention one that I remember, basically. Do you see that? They looked and looked and looked. They never saw it. I wow. said, come on, see that, see that. Wow. The father and son and the lamp. Wow. Father, son, lamp. <laughs> they never even saw anything. They said, maybe he's seen heavenly things that we clearly Catherine Crick is his disciple whatever he has imparted to or upon her it is not from God and she is his cult prodigy Those who desire to go into new levels they are the ones that I'm lifting up with the same honor the way they honored me Nataka kumpaka mafuta awamu ingine. I want to anoint her once again. To exploit the poor is wicked. Don't miss the fact that people are bringing money to the front and laying it at his feet. He wears luxurious clothes, drives in super luxurious cars, flies in in helicopters to the meeting. Compare this with the life of Christ. This man is not a godly man at all. Do not be deceived. Compare Micah chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Please read the whole chapter and note verse 8. This is what God thinks of such injustice. Come here. Stand here. I want to anoint her for another, for another time. For a new level. There are no levels of power and anointing in the Bible. This is made up nonsense to create an elite class of people who in effect become the new cult leaders. Everything about this man smacks of a cult. 
And is sadly, this lady is being sucked in and now has become his cult prodigy. This is a complete new level. The power and the anointing that things will grow greatly from today. Note he is also clothed in all white as opposed to everyone else on the platform and in the audience with the obvious intent to set himself apart as some specially anointed holy man. I release the power to change environment, to change anything in people's life. Receive it in Jesus' name. It is yours. 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 The repetition was real. I didn't do that. Repetition is a tool of hypnosis. Note well, Jesus never did this nor did any of his apostles. The anointing is one, but different meaning. So to some, this will mean another thing, and to some will mean another thing. I release this anointing. He says, I release the power. There is no precedence in the New Testament for any of this talk. He's acting as if he is God, as if he has God-like powers. The worst forms of devilish deception is to make man believe he has become like God himself. Remember what the snake said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You, Apostle Catherine, as this anointing will help you to lift her up again, will help you to uh, do what you please to make this anointing known okay. receive this anointing okay. now Paco. this is different baba we'd like to plant a seed at your feet baba we want to be used to reach all of the people of los angeles to bring them to you we there's so many people hurting in la there's so many people hurting and across america and we want god to use us to reach them and to bring them to you so that they may be healed and delivered and be directed into God's will for their life and for that so that they may receive what we have received we don't want to keep this to ourselves we want to share this with the world and all of this joy that you see in all of us and this transformation it is only because of you Baba it is only because of you Baba we would be nothing without you be nothing without you We know and recognize that you hold the keys for America and only you. We know and recognize that you hold the keys for America and only you. As John the Baptist declared, there's someone greater than me coming. We want to be used in that apostolic way. We want God to have people's eyes be open to the words we're speaking that they may hear and come to this conference and to this ministry and receive you receive the real jesus and receive Alleluia. from the real jesus through you could she be any more cultish glory to god we give ourselves we lay down ourselves we surrender and submit to you that God would use us to serve you and to ful help fulfill your vision. We plant this seed at your feet, Daddy, for God to have our way with us to serve you. We want the world to know you. We want you to be famous so that the real Jesus, Alleluia. who is full of love and power, Alleluia. may be known. You will not know the real Jesus unless they know you. He's choosing to use you for the world to see him. Asante Sana Baba, we love you so much. Asante Sana for being our father. We love you. This borders on dem demonic idolatry. When she bows down, she is bowing down like people do who are gripped in the 
uh, in the clutches of a cult. Clutch cult leaders demand 100% surrender to them. Such surrender is only to be given to God, never to another human being. What happens when human beings bow in 100% surrender to other human beings is mostly demonic control and obsession and usually is the sure sign of a cult. No human being has the right to demand such allegiance to himself. Only God, only surrender, never surrender to man what only God deserves. The same thing could be said about the man who started Mormonism. And in this light, you should view whatever she does from here.